today, as you saw in the email, there's a due date. So we'll try and get one more homework out before the end of the semester. Um, I gather that you guys know how to do the course evaluations, so I'm just supposed to remind you to do the course evaluations. And um, what else? Class canceled on Thursday. What's that? Oh, yeah. Class canceled on Thursday. You can all, I don't know how this works. You can all come into the Google Plus Hangout that Lisa Randall and I are doing, going through CERN. Don't you have to invite question. us to that? What's that? Don't you have to invite us to the hangout for that? I, I mean, this is a public, I, I don't know, is this a public thing? I think it's a public thing. You're already supposed to know about it. You're supposed to be watching the CERN website. I, actually, I don't know anything about it, so I've just tested my uh, laptop, so that's about as far as I can go. But presumably it's advertising CERN. Anyway, so it's kind of the lesson but in a practical sense. Um, what else? Oh, so the, I don't know where Rashmish is on dragging out a room and a time on Friday. So stay tuned. I'm not on top of that. Um, and so back to the action. Now, somehow I want to finish this category I, before getting back to that loop since we had a disruption the end of class anyway. I want to get back to just finishing off this categorization of field theories where we have, according to the kinds of divergences they have and our ability to renormalize these divergences away, um, which is basically the big picture uh, of renormalization. So hold, I will come back to the loop, uh, the loop expansion. Sorry, the loop calculation in DIMREG. So let's see where we were. So back to power counting of divergences, where we said there are sort of coupling constants to some. I, now I've already forgotten the letters I used. Anyway, here. There are coupling constants to some power, derivatives to some power, fields to some power. The cutoff to some power, and mass, masses to some power. And you know which ones are positive and which ones are not, so I'm not going to repeat all of that. Uh, basically, this is the one with negative positive or negative mass dimension. Okay. And uh, as an exercise, you should work out, well, in fact, the homework will be, uh, it is to look at Yukawa theory from this perspective where the field dimension of the fermion is not one, it's three halves, so you can play with all the different options. What I want to show you right now is um, the categorization of theories as normalizable, which is to say having the same features as that lambda phi to the fourth theory I went through, non-renormalizable, and super-renormalizable. Um, so let's do super renormalizing. If all couplings in your theory have positive, meaning strictly scale dimension or mass, mass dimension, strictly positive. <laughs> so, super is when this happens. Why is it worthy of note? Okay, Because it means that, so already we know that lambda, we well, so know that L plus N plus K plus D plus T has to be equal to 4. 
And we know that this has to be greater than or equal to zero, greater than or equal to zero, greater than or equal to zero, the, the k, obviously. Uh, sorry, this is, and I, uh, I said this was d, and I said this was, so how should I write it? L times, maybe I should. Is that good? So this is the scale dimension of whichever type of field you have. If you have several types of fields, you have to sum over the different terms. Um, this is the different types of couplings you have with their scale dimensions and so on. Now, here's the thing. As soon as all of these are sort of positive contributions, okay. but as soon as if you have all couplings having scale dimensions greater than zero, that is delta, lambda, i greater than zero, then it means that divergences stop appearing after some finite order and perturbation. Okay, so for example, some classic example is phi cubed quantum field theory, where the dimension one. And this coupling, as you go to higher and higher orders in perturbation theory, starts soaking up as much of the mass dimension as can fit in the form, and leaving very little room for any more cutoff dependence, positive cutoff dependence. So, that's a divergence. So, for example, you could have lambda, so you could have lambda, you could have one power of lambda. 1 phi in the divergence, starting from a phi cube vertex. Okay. You could get a divergence that looks like lambda phi, and then you could still have, so that's 1, 1, and you could have some lambda squared. You could have things like this, which is lambda squared phi squared, and then all you can afford is a log of the cutoff, say, or lambda to the zeroth power, if you want to um, So logs. But you see, you could even go to some higher order, and maybe you could somewhere there find some lambda cubed phi times some logs. But beyond this point, we can't afford any more. There are no other kind of divergent structures I could write down that are local. Okay. So that means that by cubic order, uh, or if you like, by two-loop order, I've exhausted all possible divergences. So once the theory is renormalized, so once theory renormalized to this order no further renormalization is required So this process of figuring out your divergences at every order and going through the whole algorithm that I outlined actually stops at some point at fairly low orders, and then that's it. So 
code. It's great. Um, it just doesn't happen very often. Uh, it happens more often in lower dimensional field theories, if you ever play with lower dimensional field theories, either as a theoretical laboratory or because it turns out to be the long wavelength limit of some condensed matter field theory. Um, then this is a useful thing to keep in mind. But then there's the regular renormalizable case. Uh, Professor Kino, yeah. before you go on, what is log? Log, this thing? Yeah. Um, it just means some dimensionless function of the cutoff, which typically is in perturbation. Oh, okay, so it's like dividing by something. Yeah, yeah, exactly, like log of lambda divided by energy, or log of lambda divided by m, or something like that. Okay. Um, things that are here formally called lambda to the zero, but of course it's lambda to the zero literally is one. Lambda to the zero, it means it's, 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 not, a, it's not a power sensitivity to lambda, it's at most some sort of log like sensitivity. Um, the renormalizable case is, is to be seen by contrast, which is that the lambdas, that the renormalizable means <coughs> some lambda i are dimensionless. Others may have dimension greater than zero. Okay. Um, so, but at least if all of them have dimension greater than zero, then you're super normalizable again. But if even one of them is dimensionless, and then the rest are positive dimension, or several are dimensionless, and some are positive dimension, or all of them are dimensionless, then the divergences in their worst form, you can always use the lambdas. So, 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 so then you can always get arbitrarily high order divergences because coupling in perturbation theory, sorry. Divergences keep occurring in perturbation theory order by order because if you keep working in terms of these dimensionless couplings, you're not paying a price in soaking up your budget of four. Delta is zero. And so once you fix the number of derivatives and fields as something less than or equal to four, then you can always have positive or zero powers of the cutoff. Okay? So think about it. This is exactly what happened in final and fourth field theory. Any power of lambda was allowed. But you could not argue that you would not get divergences in higher order. And uh, experience has taught us that we do. So there's no theorem that says you don't get divergences in every order. So renormalization has to be carried out order by order in perturbation. Seventh order, I can stop wasting my time for normalizing. No. Every order in perturbation theory you want to work to to get increased precision to an accurate experiment, you must do this process of normalization. But the good news is there are a finite, there's a finite number of divergences. Divergence structures which correspond to a finite number of subtractions. 
fractions or count terms that we need. And in order for subtraction not to be an active thing, in order for it to be merely an observation, that, that has to correspond to a finite, or if you want, it's just a finite number of UV sensitive observables or if you want more generally for normalized couplings. That must be taken from the experiment. The doctor's experiment. Okay. And and then if that in turn corresponds to the number or finite finite number of couplings in the bare and normalized Okay, so we've played this out in the case applied to the fourth field theory, and that is the classic example you are about to work on Power theory, which is another classic example. Um, and, and basically what it's saying is that since there are only a finite number of divergent structures, so a finite number of types of counter terms that you encounter the same types of counter terms at higher and higher orders in perturbation theory. And these counter terms are secretly, that, that is an accounting tool. You can do it nicely in terms of counter terms and blah, blah, blah. there's an algorithm for doing it. You don't have to think anything. But ultimately, what it's saying physically is that there are a finite number of UV sensitivities in your theory. And you're never going to be able to calculate them from nothing. You better just go and measure them, or if you want, as a theorist, take them as input, not output. And then everything else is output, but it's a finite output. Okay? In terms of these quantities, there's a finite one. Um, and if you want, that thinking of, the, of them as input formally is to take them as the couplings of the normalized action. And since the bare action is the normalized action plus counter terms, the bare action also has a set of similar forms. So we've seen all of this at the level of five of the four. So <coughs> these are the two nice, seemingly nice types of theories. But we are holding off now, and now we have to get to it, to the non-normalizable category. Yeah? When you say a finite number of couplings in the bare action, yes. can't you have a bare action that has just like a finitely many terms, but then if it's not renormalizable, you get an infinite number of That's So that's what I'm coming to here. And so far, I've insisted that the coupling constants all have scale dimension greater than or equal to zero. So the case you're talking about is the one that I'm about to hit. Okay? So wait, what does that mean? Do you mean bare or renormalized action, or bare and renormalized action? The, both the bare and the renormalized actions have a finite number of terms. So, yeah, that's equivalent to saying that it's renormalized. So that three, four, well, rather, four, the implication six. goes, so, these are the things that are equivalent. If the theory has just a couple of constants with dimensions greater than or equal to zero, then the following are equivalent. You mean you can read it backward or forward. Oh, Namely, there are a finite number of divergent structures. That is secretly to say, the deep statement is, there's a finite number of ways this theory depends on the far UV. And uh, so finite right. number of inputs when we write it as accountants, 
we use this method of counter terms and the renormalized action to equal the bare action. Great. So that has the so same. So these are just all implications. These are all implications of this. Yeah. Okay. But now we hit the non-renormalizable case where even, oh, so one or more lambda i have scale dimension. less than zero. This is the case that uh, where the whole budget is you have to equal four. But as you go to higher and higher orders in perturbation theory, this term becomes more and more negative, which allows you more and more room for all of these things to still be there. So you can still have something with a positive lambda a large number of fields in it, a large number of derivatives in it, and it can still all be dimension four, so that it's a Lagrangian density. How? By just working to high enough order in perturbation theory, because this has got negative mass dimension. Okay? So when this happens, there are an it implies there are an infinite number, infinitely infinitely Many divergence types. Now we are in trouble because this part is still, I mean, the types of divergence structures correspond, of course, to the types of subtractions you need to make, which requires which tells you the number of types of counter terms that you need to include, which is equivalent, if you like, to the number of UV sensitive quantities that are in your theory, which, however, in this case, is infinitely many UV infinite quantities. So what are you supposed, what's the grand? Can you go with that again in this term of your flow? How yeah. do you figure this? Oh, um, so infinitely many, so for example, in there, L delta lambda less than zero. So any V to the N phi to the K lambda to the D, we want this pathetic thing called M to the T. All of the any, any local operator you make of this structure, very divergent. Sorry, did I call it D? Because D is meant to be something else. Yeah. All right, so S. Um, any divergent structure that you want, this this thing could have dimension greater than four, what I've written down. Allowed. though dimension could be much greater than 4 with coefficient arising from po from coefficient arising from higher order perturbation theory which is lambda to the l or big enough L. Because it can cancel the dimension, the excess dimension and get you back to four. So, so this means even at one loop, because you can keep adding these things to your graphs and they'll make them more divergent, the whatever this uh, interaction is, that even to one loop, come up with a finite number of counter terms. And no, in fact, in fact, there's a saving. So let me just read, let me tell you the story the way the original quantum field theorists read the implications. Um, so so hold your question for one second. This naively, so there, this naively corresponds to infinitely 
many. So if you just go through the program, what's wrong with an infinite number? Because in the end, it says that the infinite number, infinitely many input parameters, infinitely many input parameters are required before I can tell you some prediction. In QED, I measure the charge of the electron, the mass of the electron, and then I start telling you everything in sight. Right? But, but here, it would appear, a robot at least, would say there there are infinitely many divergence types that corresponds to infinitely many types of counter terms I need, which corresponds to infinitely many uh, the renormalized couplings and bare couplings. The difference between the difference of which is the counter terms. And ultimately, it's an infinite number of ways to be sensitive to the ultraviolet, and therefore I can't escape the ultraviolet. Can't just measure my way out of sensitivity to the ultraviolet. I need to know is it a cutoff? Is it, is it a lattice, space time lattice at short distances? Is it string theory at short distances? I need to know. So it would seem. But, um, and we're not going to go further down this road in this class. However, just to hint at what the answer is, saving grace. to any fixed order in perturbation theory, the, the number of divergent structures is finite. number of divergent structures is the number of sensitivities to the ultraviolet, which is the number of input parameters before you make any prediction. However, suppose you decided that you wanted to work to some order in perturbation theory, 17th order in lambda. Okay? If that's true, then you can only afford to put 17 powers of lambda in doing this little, in doing this little calculation of possible divergences. You only need to put 17 in L. But that caps how negative this can be, which tells you a cap on how positive all this can be. And since everything here is positive, that's going to restrict it's a pretty big list, but it's a finite list of divergences of this type that can appear. And so if you know you only want to work to order lambda of the 17, for whatever reason, that you get all the benefits of um, renormalizability, namely a finite number of input parameters allows you to predict everything, but not to arbitrary order, only to order lambda to the 17. So another way to say it is that the number of input parameters in QED, the number of input parameters stays two even if I work to 17th order, 18th order, 19th order, and alpha. Okay. Whereas in a non-normalizable theory, you can have all the benefits, but as you move from order to order in perturbation theory, you need to increase your precision, you need to have more input parameters. You need to measure more parameters before you're willing to make a prediction. So at second order, you might need three input parameters in a non-normalizable theory before you can predict anything. Then you want to go to third order, and you may need to make five measurements from the data before you can then predict anything. And if you want to go to fourth order, you might need to measure 17 input parameters before you can measure anything. It's a hard game, but it's a game that occurs in real life. As I there explain. won't be any renormalization conditions in your view. Sure, there are lots of renormalization problems. Yeah, you want 17 renormalization conditions? Give me 17 interesting cross sections with different input scattering angles. And yeah, there's lots that we can get. And you might say this is some sort of theoretical thing that we never do. But indeed, we have non-renormalizable theories where 
we do work at reasonably high enough order and precision um, and play this dirty, rotten, but incredibly predictive game. I mean, it's painful. The classic case is the Cairo Lagrangian of pi -ons, where the coupling constant has the same dimension as, say, the weak interactions. The other classic case is the weak interactions, which you might say, wait, wait, didn't they give out a few Nobel Prizes for their normalizable theory of the weak interactions? And, 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 and so let me come to that. Okay? They also gave a, some Nobel Prizes for the theory of pi -ons called QCD. So why are we using non-renormalizable interactions? Let me come to that in a second. Yeah. So this this is we got that it was non-renormalizable just by sort of dimensional analysis. Yeah. Is there ever a case where due to some high degree of symmetry, something that's like superficially non-renormalizable is actually renormalizable? Yes, absolutely. There are cases where well, there are, there are two types of exceptions to this analysis. This is the worst case analysis. As I constantly tell my kids, the worst case always is saturated. <laughs> uh, so the two examples are cases where, um, well, let me just think of the case where, so that you, you're asking if there's a case where there's a negative mass dimension. And unfortunately, there I only know one controversial. One, like like uh, super like n equals eight supergravity or something, which is claimed to have this feature that the symmetry is strong enough to so kill. Is that, is what that open right now? Whether or not it's supernormalizable? Do that? people not know if that one's supernormalizable? Um, let's just say it's debated, and, and part partly because of something I'm about to say. Okay, so, so the, the, the question is, what are you gaining by its technical normalizing? What, what meat and potatoes thing are you gaining? other than this, like, deciding is Pluto a planet, you see? And, and, and so you might say, gosh, I think the number of input parameters makes a difference to me, okay? I think so, you, you would say. But let me try and come back to that in a second. It's a kind of a subtle case. The other case is simply that a theory which does have negative mass dimension, this analysis is very perturbative. In fact, you will have noticed I'm doing everything order by order in perturbation theory. Is it possible to have coupling constants with negative mass dimension which are, however, perfectly OK uh, because of some non-perturbative magic. Yes, there are. And uh, so how we figure that out is a stunning piece of detective work. Um, but it is true that it's possible. And so sometimes you hear in the case of gravity, people holding out, people as mighty as Weinberg, <laughs> holding out the option that somehow it might be UV finite even though the coupling constant, G Newton, has negative mass dimension. Personally, I find that a bit of a long shot. But anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Who am I to argue with the mighty one? Um, so, uh, so you can sort of work order by order. It's just that the job gets harder and harder. The number, even the job for the experiment, forget the job of the theorist. Theorists cost nothing. It doesn't matter how hard. The job of the experimentalist is getting harder and harder as you go to higher order and perturbation. They have to make more measurements before you as a theorist are willing to predict one thing. Okay, that, so that's the real, as I said, the solid sense in which this makes a difference. And, but, but to really understand what's going on, we should also understand what are we perturbing in when we have something with negative mass dimension. Because it's dimensionful, you can't say the coupling is small. You can't talk about a dimensionful coupling and say it's small. It's got to be small with respect to some other dimensional coupling, some other dimensionful quantity. Okay. So secretly, so, the, the lambda expansion is really a lambda times some energy or momentum. Let me just say energy. Okay. Of course, you 
really expanding in some dimensionless quantity. And the dimensions are provided by the kinematics of the process that you're interested in, which I'm just going to crudely call energy, but it roughly is energy and momentum. And I've chosen the power of the momentum and energy so that this combination is dimensionless by the definition I gave of delta. Okay. So this is the expansion you're really doing. So when you decide to do a finite order in perturbation theory, or to work in perturbation theory, you're really expanding in this. And this, this thing, this breaks down for energies such that lambda e to the minus delta lambda. Expansion, so, so, so this notice, this thing here is positive by definition of delta, negative but not normalized. So what you're really doing is a low energy expansion. Okay, it's energy divided, it's it's G Fermi times energy squared. It's G Newton times energy squared. So it's a low energy expansion. And it breaks down. Even though you, the experimentalist can say, I can, I can wrap up the energy. I have no problem going to even higher energy. But the theory itself, as described in this way of dealing with it, is actually going to break down when the energies get to the characteristic scale of this coupling process. When energies get to order the Planck scale, when energies get to order the, the, the weak scale, the non-normalizable theory is going to break down. You can't even do the perturbation theory to get a high enough kinematic. So it's an unusual thing that the theory, the breakdown is happening in a kinematic, is happening in a due to going to a kinematic region which you could easily envision experimentally. And yet the theory will stop answering. At least the perturbative theory will stop answering. And that's not what we're used to with either QED or lambda by the fourth, where it keeps answering all our questions by and large. Okay. So, this is the beginnings of their, of what is called, but, but, but as long as your energies are low compared to this characteristic scale of coupling, life is good, good enough, meaning that order by order, in energy over whatever this scale is, you are able to calculate as long as you measure enough input parameters to some order in lambda, you can predict many quantities. Um, this leads to what is called effective field theory. So, or non-normalizable effective field theory. Which is to say, this is a theory, but it has a kind of a restriction on it. It seems to allow you to do interesting calculations, very interesting calculations, that can even be matched to experiment with great profit. It can be done in non-normalizable effective field theory but it's effective in the sense that there's a cap on the kinematics. Not all kinematics that you can imagine will this theory give you the answers to. It will break down. And, and in fact, therefore, to the extent that you ever chance on an effective field theory in nature, you will be convinced that there is new physics to be found once your energies get to where this happens. Because this theory will break down. So, so something interesting is going to happen. We love because we are guaranteed new physics at some modestly new scale of energy which we can hope that experimentalists will reach in our lifetimes. Okay? We love that. Um, this has happened, as I said, in the case of pion scattering. Pion scattering has a non-normalizable effective Lagrangian. And Indeed, by the 1 GV scale, the theory of pions completely breaks down. If you think of pions as elementary particles in this way that we are doing. And it's replaced by a stunning theory, the most beautiful theory that has ever been devised, including string theory, okay? Because it's dual string. But anyway, <laughs> and, and that is quantum chromodynamics, okay? So it doesn't get better than that, right? 
like there's some sign of non-homomorphizability of that. All hell breaks loose, and you discover pions are actually made out of something. That if energy is a one GeV, the pion no longer looks elementary. That breaks the ground rules for all my discussions. It's not a point particle at that at that length scale, and it is completely revamped into and incorporated into the theory of quantum field dynamics. Um, of course, the other case is uh, the weak interactions. And the weak interactions are, again, a case where the Fermi way of thinking about it, the Fermi coupling constant has dimension minus 2. It's bad news. Somewhere before you get to the weak scale, you're going to hit energies where this happens. So somewhere before that, the theory must break down completely. And of course, we know it breaks down into the standard model of particles. Minimally, the Salon Weinberg structure of the standard model. Okay. Now, there's a baby version of that which you can play with right now, which is to invent your own weak interactions uh, as an exercise. I recommend talking it through with your buddies at whatever level of sophistication you want. And you can do loops, you can do if loops in effective field theory. Um, so, classic cases, we say, um, so, let's do So we, this is an effective field theory, but it leaves quite the hanging question, what, what happens at high energy? question lurking here. Uh, what's going to happen at high energy? So, and the, the answer is, there must be some UVs. So the answer is some UV completion. So the notion of a UV completion is to take a non-normalizable theory and to say that that non-normalizable theory is missing the full truth which, however, only becomes apparent once you get to higher energies, and that effective field theory is no longer valid. And the, the true theory that sits on top of a non-normalizable theory is what we would call a UV complete, a UV complete theory. So some normalizable theory is the truth, and this is only an approximation. How could that be? How could there be a deeply a, a, a normalizable theory at work, and yet, as an experimentalist and phenomenological theorists going back and forth, all you manage to piece together is a non-normalizable theory. How could that happen? So the simplest example it has all the spirit of the standard model is Yukawa, the Yukawa theory, our, our old friend. Okay? So the Yukawa theory has this coupling G psi bar psi phi and and uh, so I, lambda, phi to the fourth, and things like that, right? And these things have dimension, are dimensionless. So as you will look at in the homework and so on, this, this is an example of a normalizable theory as much as lambda phi to the fourth by itself is a normalizable theory. Great, so everything is fine. However, suppose the energies of my experiments are considerably smaller than, or just smaller, than the mass of the scalar. But, but bigger than the mass of the fermion. Then, when you do, say, fermion scattering, you can't, you can't create phi's. The phi is out of bounds. You can't create it. But if you do scattering like this, this goes like i over p squared minus so let me make it like this p squared minus m phi squared plus i epsilon. Okay, and times some g squared. So I'm not going to care refactor, right? And this is approximately g squared over m phi squared, because p is the 
center of mass energy, say, of this fermion scattering process. So P is some kinematic invariant. It's either S, T, or U. Okay. So if I'm saying that the energies that I have accessible to me are smaller than the mass of phi, then you can drop this fact, and you end up with this. So they are going. So this looks, which which looks just like a Feynman rule that looks like this, where G Fermi, in quotes, because it's not got the exact spin structure of the four fermion Fermi things. It's not got the left-left structure, the V minus A structure of G Fermi. This one will work this out. If you take this approximation, say, what is the chirality structure of this? It's slightly different. It's scalar, scalar rather than axial, rather than left-handed vector, uh, vector, vector. It's not got the vector, vector form. It's not got the B minus A, B minus A form. It has scalar, scalar form. That's a detail, as far as I'm concerned. But it, it matches this, where the G Fermi is equal to little g squared over m phi squared. So, the theorist or the phenomenologist looking at the experimental data would say this coupling fits all my data. And it has negative mass dimension. And they wouldn't know that secretly it looks like this. That the negative mass dimension is actually the is given by, is set by the physical mass of a new particle, which they have no way of producing because they don't have enough energy. But <coughs> nevertheless, it would be true. And as they go to higher and higher energies, this approximation would break down in, because, because you can't completely neglect this. And then one fine day, they would actually produce this on shell and say, gosh, we produced the W boson or the Z or something like that, right? So here is a kind of repeat of the prehistory of our subject, which, like in all animal life, is alive and well on your insides, and it worked. Okay, so so this is this is it, and and so once you you might think the story is even more interesting than just the defeat of the ancient in, in, in favor of the modern theory, right? Out with this, in with this. Um, the this theory this theory will fit low energy data, but ultimately will have to give way to the new thing at higher and higher energies. However, suppose you are actually doing low energy. You know, sometimes we have a battle between, in fact, this is playing out in quantum physics right now, politics-wise. We have the battle between the intensity frontier and the energy frontier. I can either do high luminosity scattering at low energies, or low luminosity, relatively speaking, low luminosity scattering at incredibly high energies. Well, why I like high energies? Because I can just produce that new particle. Why do I like low intense? Why do I like high intensity? Because I can go to very high energies, sorry, I can go to very high statistics and try and look for virtual new physics. Okay? And uh, as I try to give you in that world inside worlds picture at the beginning of these lectures, uh, high sensitivity allows you to draw virtual diagrams inside the guts of some process where the virtual momenta are really high energies and probing all the new particles that are up there. So there are two ways of trying to get at higher energies. One, directly go to the high energies and produce the particles. Or sometimes, by working up the intensity frontier, you can go to even higher energies than you could hope to get by direct attack. And just getting virtual sensitivity to super high energy scales. In that kind of game, you might actually work at this level of approximation for many, for many purposes. And there's a benefit of non-renormalizable theories. While non-renormalizable theories don't allow you to work at very high energies, they do have fewer fields in them than the UV complete theory. String theory has, if you want to think of it as a theory of many particles, has many, many particles, whereas general relativity has just the graviton, say. So 
there's the benefit of, for a theorist of calculating with fewer moving parts. This theory has two moving parts. This theory has one moving part. That is an incredible simplification in calculation. So often, the smart, effective field theory trained modern theorist knows the UV complete theory and yet does not work directly with it. They figure out what is the so-called matching effective field theory, which is non-renormalizable, and they compute with this whenever it is in the domain of validity in energy to use this theory. And only when they need to go to high energies do they bring out the big guns and use this. Okay, So that's an appropriate response to a difference in theory. So all of these things, that's why I say these are all living limbs of the theory. It's not like as soon as you discover the UV completion of a non-renormalizable theory, that you kick the non-renormalizable theory out the door. Far from it. Uh, you, you, you continue to use it where it is appropriate because it is often the simplest way of doing calculations with the fewest moving parts. It's also, and simple means right. If it is not simple, you will make a mistake. You will make a mistake. <laughs> and uh, so, so it's, it's crucial to bring the number of moving parts down close to one or zero. Okay. Um, and by this philosophy, you can just see over time, you, people you meet, you can, I, I, I've seen it so many times, the sheer, how, how somebody with twice the IQ, but half the training in this kind of moving between effective field theory and field theory, how they fall to the just slightly above average person who has however been trained in effective field theory thinking and has taught themselves effective field theory thinking and how many calculations that works. Um, so, I'm not going to teach it, but learn. Um, okay, okay. Now, that was my long rant. Where did that leave me? Oh, that left me back where I started last, ended last time. Okay, so even that, I want to do it right since I have taken that big break. So we're back to this phi to the fourth. We're back to thinking about this as a contribution to the effective matrix. And, um, and as I said, the one, the, the one loop effective action contains this, thought of as an amputated diagram. And I said it has some, it has some. Naive, the naive um, there's some unknown number. We'll see why it's unknown, why I have to fit fit this. and then some delta function um, for momentum conservation. And, uh, and using this, remember, using this, if you want to calculate the actual time order phi 1, phi 4, but Fourier transform to momentum space, this is 
the connected. If you want to cal calculate the connected Green's function, and you are handed this, you are supposed to draw tree diagrams using this, thinking of this as some sort of effective vertex. You're supposed to draw tree diagrams, and then you'll get the connected guy. Okay. So this is going to be. So if you want connected guys, you sort of think of having a source there, although you might have even erased it and took a functional derivative of respect to j. So you're, here you're calculating, including this, this line is included, it's not amputated by anything else. It's there, it's just connected graphs, the way you were taught before you came to this class. Okay. Yes. But of course we know there are loop contributions. So this is the one, two, three, four in momentum space, right? But you could also draw this graph, one, two, three, four. And indeed, it does look like this little box here. It looks like a case of taking this one loop effective vertex and using it just like you use this vertex. You're using it here. But because it's non-local, because it's got two special places. You could also do it like this. Um, in other words, the same effective vertex here could be turned on its side and put in like this. If you're confused by this, just write the same expression in position space and see what your options are. Okay. Basically, in this effective vertex, <clears throat> two lines come out of this space-time point and two lines out of this space-time point. Okay? And so when you're given four lines that you need to connect, you can connect three and four to the same point, or you can connect three and one to the same point, and so on. These are all the numbers. And then, of course, there is um, 